science enthusiasts, my name is Jason Zakowski. I'm a high school chemistry teacher and a science communicator, but I'm also the dog dad of Bunsen and Beaker, the science dogs on social media. If you love science and you love pets, you've come to the right place. Put on your lab coat, put on your safety glasses, and hold on to your tail. This is the Science Podcast. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Science Podcast. We hope you're happy and healthy out there. Great week launch of Bunsen 2.0. Thank you so much to everybody. We we hit our target and we're able to go through with getting Bunsen 2.0. The stuff is super adorable. And as well, going forward with the text from Bunsen ebook and audiobook, which will be really fun this, this summer to put together. I mentioned last week that I was one of the speakers at commencement for the grads or at graduation. And um, my speech was about how we should try to be the person that our dog thinks we are. And it was adorable. And Chris was such a big help. She scooted the dogs in at the end of my speech. And and then the dogs got to meet all of the kids after grad. So that was really special. What do we got on tap for the science podcast this week? In science news, we're going to look at the stuff growing in moon dust. Uh, That made the rounds last week. And I thought we should break it down. In pet science, we're going to take a look at how cats maybe know the names of other cats in the household. Can cats understand that? Well, let's, let's break it down. Our expert guest this week is material scientist in the quantum realm, (laughs) Andrea Damascheli. It's such a cool conversation. Hey dogs, what did the subatomic quantum pirate say to the theoretical physicist? Walk the plank. (laughs) Oh, that's so bad. Okay, well, on with the show, because there's no time like science time. This week in science news, let's take a look at that story about how scientists were able to grow plants in moon dust. Now, not to burst your bubble, the plants didn't grow all that well. That's the bad news. The good news is the plants did grow in moon dust, and that's fantastic. You may not know, but samples have been brought back from the moon in most of the moon missions where the astronauts landed on the moon. Now, there's not a lot of the the sample to go around, so they had to be really picky and choosy about using any of the samples and perhaps growing food in it took a bit of debate before they decided to sacrifice some of those samples for botany. Why have they just now tried to grow stuff in moon dust? Well, it could be because NASA's sending people back to the moon with the Artemis mission. And one of the objectives is to make some kind of like semi-permeant moon base orbiting the moon. So if you can somehow grow your own food, maybe on the surface of the moon, of course, this is long term, then it makes it a lot more sustainable. Now, the stuff that's on the moon is called regolith, and it's not like dirt on Earth at all. Uh, it's it's actually terrible for plants. It's terrible, actually, to breathe in it because it's a powder of super sharp little tiny bits of like basically sharp rock and iron and metal and glass. And it's because the surface of the moon doesn't have dirt. It's just like pulverized rock. And when meteorites hit the rock and pulverize it into dust, some of that dust gets so hot it turns into glass. So it doesn't have much in the way of nutrients to grow anything. So nutrients had to be supplemented to the moon dust in order for plants to grow. It doesn't have any nitrogen, no phosphorus. Um, so it was, it's a rough go to try to grow plants in it. Now, the plant they decided to grow is a plant I've never heard of, but <laughs> but it's called... Thalecress. I guess it's like some kind of mustard plant. I don't know. It's super hardy, meaning that it doesn't need a lot of uh, material to grow in. Probably that's why they chose it. So there was three different samples that of moon dust they used, uh, dust from Apollo 17, 11, and 12. And then they had a fourth sample, which was basically pulverized volcanic rock. Just to show that's from Earth, could you grow stuff in volcanic dirt? Now, they all had the exact same amount of water and the same amount of nutrients, and they were all grown under LED lights. After 16 days, it was pretty clear that the moon plants were having a lot of trouble. The volcanic plants, the Thale Crest growing in the volcanic dirt, were doing pretty good. But the Apollo 17, 11, and 12 plants, not so good. Now, while it was disappointing that they did not grow as good as the Earth analog, it was very exciting in that they grew it all. The Apollo 11 moon dust plants fared the worst. And one of the ideas was that where the astronauts 
got dust from or dirt regolith from for Apollo 11 was m- more ancient. So it has been exposed on the surface of the moon for longer. So it probably had a more dangerous cocktail of things that are bad for plants. Now, one of the things that they also looked at was um, in the plants, some of the genes for stress were turned on. So the plants actually knew what they were growing in was super bad, (laughs) like super stressful, high salinity, um, not a lot of water. So these stress genes were turned on which would be the exact thing that thing that would happen on earth if a plant was struggling from you know stuff in the soil that would make it sick so what's the conclusion here well a plants can grow in moon dust b if you're going to grow stuff on the moon you need to find the least ancient <laughs> moon dirt so wherever apollo 11 scooped it up from don't have your garden there and there could be other plants that may be just as hardy, hardy as thalecress um one of the researchers suggested spinach Okay, so it's you're kind of limited with what you can grow in this and you do need to bring your own nutrients to the moon. But you do then have you don't have to worry about bringing the soil to the moon, which would be extremely expensive and take up a lot of cargo space. So when they figure this out in a few years, are we going to be paying a premium for moon spinach? (laughs) I don't know. Would you eat it? I would. But then I'd feel bad because it's basically eating a science experiment. That's science news for this week. This week in pet science, let's talk about cats and if cats are listening. So (laughs) I've made the joke with Chris and Adam that Ginger doesn't know her name and she doesn't know anything. She kind of comes and goes as she pleases, um, but she does come for treats. I don't know if she comes when she hears her name. Now, I didn't know this, but in doing some background research for this story, um, Cats do know their name. That was proven in a bunch of studies before that they do understand their name. Now, a study in Japan found that not only do cats know their name, but they also know the names of other cats in the households. And a few select cats even understand the names of their cat parents. Okay, so that just gives more evidence that cats are always listening. Cats are understanding. They just choose when they want to do things. So this comes from the Department of Psychology at Kyoto University. So to figure out if the cats could hear the names and understand the names of other cats in the same household, they needed cats that came from households with more than one cat. And I guess they had to find some cat people because the cats that took part in the study lived in a home with at least three cats. So not two cats, three or more. The cats from the household heard a recording of their cat parent saying the name of one of the cats that lived in their house they were then shown they were shown you can imagine a researcher showing a cat a photo they showed a photo of a cat or one of the other cats so what they found was when the name said by the cat parent and the photo matched the cat only looked at the photo for a very short time and when the name and the photo didn't match the cat looked for a lot more time, like scrutinizing the photo. They had another sample set of cats, cats from cat cafes, and the cats from cat cafes just did terrible at everything. They didn't really know their name. They didn't know the name of their cats. And I guess the the researchers chalked that up to the cats were living in an area where there could be over 30 cats. So they're constantly hearing different names, random names, people calling them different names, people calling other cats different names. So they're not super conductive if you're a cat to learn things. But if you live in a household where the name is used over and over and over again, that's where the key lies. So not uh, not every cat responded the same way to hearing hearing the name of a cat parent and the picture. So they didn't respond to the expectancy violation, meaning that they uh, weren't puzzled that the name and the picture were different. Some cats were oh, did okay, and they 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 were like, wait, that's not right. Um, but other cats were indifferent. So it, it may, means that not every cat really keys in on the names of people in the household. What does that mean? Well, that's a great question. It just means that cats just maybe need more practice with names. Um, Maybe you can work with your cat and teach it its name and teach it your name. Cats can follow directions. Cats can learn tricks. They just don't have the same drive to please that dogs do. 
So don't, don't expect to have a marathon training session with your cat. You might be able to do it a couple times. And then the cat's like, well, okay, let's, this is dumb. Let's move on from this. I guess maybe we should work on teaching Ginger her name. That's pet science for this week. Hello, everybody. The science podcast will always be free to download and listen to. You'll never have to worry about paying for it, but we have some amazing ways that you can help us out with running the show. The first one is to think about becoming a patron on Patreon. And we call our patrons now the Paw Pack. (laughs) There's a whole bunch of awesome perks and different tiers of support. We also have a very detailed and excellent merch store. And if you're listening to this in time, we have pre-orders of the Bunsen 2.0 stuffy that was just adorable. Um, You can check it out. There's also the Beaker Stuffy on our store and a whole bunch of comfy clothes. The third thing you can do is give us a good rating. Rate the podcast wherever you're listening to this. We'd love to get a great rating from you. Okay, back to the show. It's time for Ask an Expert, and I have Dr. Andrea Damascelli with me today. How are you doing today? Very good. Very good. Thanks, Jason. How are you? I'm good. The most pressing question I have for you before we even get to anything else is... You got to meet Rick Mercer. Yes, uh, I did a few years ago, and it was a very interesting experience. And in fact, you know, as uh, as uh, to be expected, also my my fellow dog uh, my, was there with me. So Hunter, <laughs> Hunter participated in the process. I love that. Um, for for the American <laughs> listeners, Rick Mercer is a he's a big deal in Canada. He's like the I don't know the John Stewart of Canada, a political comedian. Was he a nice guy? Did you get to Did you get to chat with him uh, outside of what the, you were taping? Yeah, it was very interesting. So I had to, you know, admit that I had never met Rick Mercer before, or not not even not even seen his uh, his program before. <laughs> so when I was asked to 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 meet him and and do this, uh, and the topic was uh, you know superconductivity, which is pretty mm-hmm. much one of the the key topic in uh, in my lab and one of the key topic in the institute. I had to go and look at what he was doing. And so I did feel a little intimidated when I <laughs> yeah. saw how, yeah. you know, sharp and, uh, and uh, humorous he was, but also provocative in the way he was talking to scientists at times. Mm-hmm. It did turn out to be very interesting. And uh, yeah, he was, he was extremely, as expected, extremely uh, uh, vibrant and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, really sharp in the questions he was asking, the way he was talking about topics, really fast in moving from one idea to the next. Nice. So it was hard to to follow him at times and you know and be at the same pace. <laughs> uh, and the other interesting thing was that of course he spent a long time here. So before we started the show, uh, certainly he, he he was you know came across as a bit different, so more quiet, uh, easier to interact. And so definitely there was a sudden transition going from normal chit chat into okay now it's show time. Mm, gotcha. Mm-hmm. Makes sense though with show business. <laughs> yeah, very interesting. So, well, we're not, I, I didn't want to get us too off tro- topic talking about Rick Mercer. Let's chat a little bit about you. I introduced you as a doctor. Uh, what's your, what's your education in science? Yeah. So I, I started in, uh, in physics back in Italy. So it's been a long path uh, uh, coming to Canada. I, I did my bachelor in physics in Italy, Milan. I, I moved to the Netherlands for a PhD, eventually moved to Stanford for a postdoc, and then moved to Canada and made this my and made my cover my my home. It's mm-hmm. uh, interesting because you know the initial idea for me was more to do marine biology or oceanography, which is one of my major passions. And uh, physics just came up as extremely exciting in the last year of high school, and I moved into that with. The idea, perhaps one day, to go back to oceanography, it never happened. You were, when as a young person, were you interested more in the ocean than physics? How did how did the transition occur from that to to physics? Well, the, the passion for the ocean really was there since I was a kid. You know, I spent mm. so much time in the water, under the water, doing all kinds of activities from from diving, fishing, surfing, and so on. And so, certainly, the passion for physics came up at a more intellectual level during high school. And so then at that point, the two had to, yeah, uh, you know, uh, sort of started competing with each other. And, mm-hmm. uh, and so then I tried to find a path that would allow me to explore and, uh, you know, and sort of satisfy my curiosity. 
and with the hope perhaps of going back one day, which uh, I've tried many times. Where are you right now in your career? Yeah, I've been at UBC for about 20 years and in the Department of Physics and Astronomy. And about uh, you know, in 2015, I became the director of the Quantum Matter Institute. In fact, mm. it's called now the Stuart Blossom Quantum Matter Institute from the uh, donor who has uh, supported us over the years. And uh, that's where I am. And, uh, and, uh, and so we are located on Vancouver campus in a new building that was recently uh, developed, thanks to the donation of our philanthropist. And, <laughs> and that's where the old institute is. And we're talking about 280 people, counting faculty, students, postdocs, and staff. I'm very jealous that you live on the coast. I mean, that would, I guess that would, you could keep your passion alive for marine oceanography and marine biology being that close to one of the, the big oceans. Definitely. In fact, mm -hmm. uh, before, you know, I kept going back a few years ago, I was accepted as a summer student. That was about five years ago as a summer student in a marine research lab here on uh, oh. the coast of BC for uh, where I was supposed to be installing a, a hydrophone underwater network uh, to record uh, humpback whale uh, songs and communications and, and then transmit those uh, and GPS locations uh, uh, to, to the lab. Unfortunately, it didn't work out for, you know, life challenges. And, uh, but yeah, I've tried and I keep trying. Which station was that? that where were you, where you at for that as a student? It was in the, it was located in uh, around uh, Bella Bella, which is uh, halfway up along, you know, towards uh, Prince Rupert, so halfway okay. up along the, yeah. the coast of BC in a tiny okay. remote island. Neat. I know um, we take our students, uh, like I'm a high school chemistry teacher, and I run the marine biology program, and we take our students pre-COVID, of course, everything's been a little bit off because of COVID, uh, to Banfield, which is the research station on the west coast of the island. Um, and the yeah. kids just, they get blown away because they're from landlocked Alberta. There's no, there's not an ocean within driving distance, let's just say. Right, right. <laughs> now that you're deep into physics and you've been at UBC for 20 years and you're, um, you're the director of this quantum research facility, the first question I have is for our listeners, could, could you explain to us what the heck quantum materials are? Um, because you hear the word quantum thrown about all over the place, uh, maybe even in like the Marvel movies with Ant-Man and the average person probably really doesn't have a good concept of what they are. Okay. Let me try the, okay. <laughs> you know, the materials, you know, starting with materials, materials have been the, the basis for, for technology oh. from a very early, you know, uh, time of mankind. You know, you go from stone to iron and, uh, and through all the way uh, to the kind of materials we use today in electronics. And so, for instance, you know, the old electronics that we use today, internet, computer, uh, are based on a single invention, which is uh, the transistor, uh, which is an electronic device. And, and that electronic device was made possible uh, as far as the modern implementation uh, by the discovery of a certain kind of material. These are called semiconductors. And so we deal with materials in all of our life. And, uh, you know, we, we transport a current. The current that goes into our laptop is usually running through copper wires. Uh, the laptop itself will be all based on chips, which uh, are built upon these uh, semiconductor materials where you can control the current very finely. And, uh, and so this is what we usually call conventional materials that we're used to. And we can describe the phenomena uh, which occur in those materials on the basis of conventional physics, classical physics. However, there are some phenomena that escape that kind of explanation. Uh, one of them being, for instance, superconductivity, uh, where now you have a current that can flow in a wire without any dissipation. Basically, the moment you move, you start moving the cur current, so the electrons are charged in that wire, they will run indefinitely even material is a superconductor. Describing this is not possible using conventional physics. And that's where we now have to use quantum physics, which typically is something that we encounter when we go into the infinitesimal small, uh, you know, when you look for instance, the atomic structure. Uh, right. Like as things get smaller, we have to use a different type of physics because everything, classical physics doesn't necessarily work. Is that, am I on right. the right track? That's per exactly right. 
And okay. so now the point is when we talk about quantum materials is but these are materials that express those those properties, those very exotic quantum mechanical properties, not in the infinitely small, but at a very macroscopic level, something that you can see with your bare eyes. What? And really? So, I thought, oh, okay. Okay, this is so cool. I'll continue. Sorry, you just blew my mind a bit. I'm sorry. <laughs> some examples of that, you know, one is uh, when we look at magnetic levitation, uh, it's probably the, uh, the one that has uh, stimulated the imagination the most. Magnetic levitation based on superconductor is a, a situation where you have a material which has been brought by, for instance, using temperature, cooling down the material, using temperature as a control parameter into a state where the system can carry the current without any dissipation. And uh, not only that, but also can go through uh, uh, a, a, a process which allow, allows magnetic levitation. So uh, in that case, you could even imagine of having a train, floating onto uh, a, a magnetic track and being suspended through the interaction between the superconductor and the magnet below. And in fact, trains like this have been realized, and now a train of that kind can travel without friction. So again, not only no dissipation in the current, but also mechanical dissipation mm. that you would have if you have wheels on a, on a track. So, uh, and that is, you know, a quantum mechanical effect. There is no other way of explaining it, and it's based on a material which is a superconductor. And this is only one of the examples. There are many examples. M many of those, for instance, are materials that exhibit these quantum mechanical properties would be the basis for quantum computation, which is one of the applications which, again, has uh, stimulated the, the public imagination the most. And, and so that's what we refer to quantum material system that exhibit these very special properties at a very macroscopic scale so that you, can, you could, in principle, take advantage of them in normal life, in applications, you know, that really would impact uh, the quality of life. And uh, if we talk about superconductivity, the dream, and that's what many of us are, are working on, is to create a superconductor that doesn't require being cooled down below room temperature. So what mm. we try to achieve mm. is room temperature superconductivity as one of those uh, quantum state. So I'm thinking like when you talk about magnetic levitation, I've done this with my students before and it blows their mind. We have uh, a little, it's a kit and I can't profess to really understand a hundred percent of how it works because I'm a chemistry generalist. <laughs> uh, but when you cool it with liquid nitrogen, the magnet floats, right? As that magnetic levitation that you're speaking of. Yes. And so in, in terms of, uh, yeah, when you're cooling down this, this superconductor, which by what you described, is a copper oxide-based superconductor, similar to the one that we make here at, at uh, UBC in the Quantum Matter Institute, mm -hmm. and which has a transition temperature from the normal to the superconducting state, which is above the, the boiling point of nitrogen. And uh, at that point, uh, the, the you know, two effects will happen. And one is that the superconductor will expel magnetic fields, but if you press the superconductor towards the magnet, some of those magnetic field lines will enter the superconductor and will keep it uh, uh, stuck in position. And that is yeah, it locks it. Lock. It locks it in place, so you cannot pull it, you know, away or push it any further. It keeps it in place. And there are very, you know, elegant ways of making a track that really will keep your your <laughs> floating superconductor stable and able to move once you pushed it indefinitely along that track. Right. I think I've seen video of you. This is what you showed Rick Mercer, I believe. Like you shoved it and it exactly. went around and around and around. Okay, gotcha. Very exactly. Cool. And that's why, you know, got him really excited. You know, <laughs> he defined it as the, the future of hair hockey. And yeah, it, it would be great. And that was also what excited my dog. He, my dog really yep. goes uh, really he wanted to out of his mind. He wanted yeah. to grab the thing. It was, <laughs> the thing. It was <laughs> yes. just a couple follow-up questions. One, it, I think it's easy for us to think of uh, something that floats that would be useful for mankind. Uh, two, is the reason why a floaty train or a levitating train would be so beneficial is because you cut out friction from it touching the ground? Like, is that a big efficiency jump? It is a huge efficiency jump. Yeah, it is. It is also... Uh, a huge efficiency efficiency jump how you run the, the train because this is all um, based on electricity. That's how you push the train along. So effectively, the moment you can control and flow electricity, which means power with no dissipation, without limits, 
you know, that really would be a major uh, step forward, you know, towards a more sustainable uh, society, a more sustainable, uh, you know, economy from the energetic point of view. And so quantum materials are now being used in all kinds of directions. Also, when we talk about, you know, lithium uh, batteries, uh, there is a huge amount of work here in the Institute and around the world in improving the lifetime of those batteries, so mm-hmm. solid state batteries, mm-hmm. in uh, improving uh, our ability to store energy, to, to generate energy. So it's, it's really uh, permeating all of the areas of technology. Uh, quantum materials are also being used uh, when it comes to uh, you know, devices, new devices, flexible uh, miniaturized devices that we can implant in a human body to monitor uh, you know, all, all kinds of functionality, vital functionality of the human body. We have, have, even have projects here with the Stuart Blossom Spinal Core Center where we are working on implanting devices in a, spinal, in a injured spinal cord uh, and use these, these you know, monoatomic like, so extremely thin detectors made of a single layer of atoms that can be then good detectors, sensitive, but also flexible, and they can be implanted and they can be used to monitor, for instance, the oxygen levels in the spinal cord during you know, the treatment to really monitor the progress of, uh, of, the, heal- the, of, the, of the healing process. And uh, you know, we also have materials that can be used to make detectors that can be used to uh, detect, you know, study dark matter or study the emission of uh, uh, X-ray from black holes. So really the range of application is immense. And uh, all of these applications take advantage of the new materials and in some cases, the technology is already well on its way. In some other cases, it's still in its infancy. And I, you know, as a, as a fundamental scientist, is being, you know, my, my job is in particular basic research. Uh, I really think that you know, often uh, the most interesting application, the most revolutionary breakthrough are the ones we can't possibly even imagine at this stage. But we know where they're going to come from. They're going to come from the new materials we will discover. So, so you're saying so, like you're aiming for a point, but the things that are created from that journey, we can't even imagine right now because we haven't got there yet. That's the kind of yes. idea. Wow. Yeah. All of the biggest, yeah, I think some of the biggest discovery that, that humanity has had came in a, you could say in a serendipitous way, mm-hmm. but of course it was, it was part of the process aiming somewhere. Yeah. Get to the moon and now we're talking to each other through the internet kind of thing. Yeah. So I, I have a lot of questions. You did a great job of explaining um, quantum materials, by the way. Thank you so much. I was, I did a little research myself and I was really fuzzy, but I get it now. Um, so I'm sure, I, I'm sure our listeners will too. So thank you. Is there any, what's the low hanging fruit? Like, well, while you say like, we're going to discover things along the way and that's amazing. Is there something that that's tangible that we that we will be able to get with these materials soon like is there something that you feel we're close to getting you know what i mean like uh not flying to another star system type thing but something realistic there is a huge number of uh yeah a huge n- number of number of possibilities here uh okay, certainly sorry <laughs> Yeah, no, certainly in the area of uh, of uh, renewable energy, I think here we are looking at major progress, which is which is already happening. And you know, the battery case is really fantastic, and uh, and so improving these kind of materials uh, really leads will lead us to to hanging fruit. I'd like to emphasize though that you know a lot of the work that we do is not just on perfecting the materials, it's really understanding the processes understanding the processes behind. Mm-hmm. So that's where we come in. The first step is understanding. The next one is, is, uh, is making materials and, and characterize them and seeing them as, uh, you know, whether they, they perform better, they're more suited for a given application. So a key, you know, a key part of this is uh, material exploration. So I'd like to highlight that, you know, nowadays there are, so many different ways that we can make materials. You know, it, it's no longer the time that you're you're just you know obtaining your material through mining and, and, and working them through. But for instance, 
you know, we grow them in the lab. We can grow them as crystals. We can grow them as extremely thin films of materials in vacuum, few monoatomic layer. We can take a, a crystal and start exfoliating to basically isolate a single atomic layer. Uh, these are all processes which have led to major discoveries, awarding a Nobel Prize, and so on. Uh, we even have here at the Institute an effort in uh, what is called combinatorial material synthesis run by robots, of course, with you know a person behind uh, <laughs> trying to, to, to uh, direct the research and understand the result, but a robot that can extremely fast scan through a wide parameter space. We're also working on growing materials under extremely high pressure, pressures which are you know, comparable to what we, you would find in the Earth mantle. So uh, basically the pressures you would need to, to grow diamond, well, we can use them now to grow other materials that do not exist in nature, which oh, have never wow. been discovered yet you know, in the soil and, uh, and are possible because we can grow them under these extreme conditions. So. The, there are very low hanging fruits on the technological level, but again, I, I like to emphasize the, the value of, of a discovery process, which is, you know, it's curiosity driven, but with an application uh, uh, eventually, and in some cases right there. So for instance, another example I'd like to mention is, you may have heard about, you know, gravitational waves. Yep. And uh, yep. a Nobel Prize was recently awarded for that discovery, uh, the detection of gravitational waves. This is an experiment that uh, you know has been done by large consortia around the world, and there is one that is connected to us. is called LIGO. It's, LIGO, uh, yeah, yeah, and uh, you know it's based on interferometry and a large scale, you know, a huge machine. We have here a faculty member in uh, in uh, physics who works on that. is part of the consortium, and we are working uh, with our uh, team of uh, of uh, expert in material synthesis on coatings, that special coatings that can be uh, made to improve the, the properties of the mirrors using those interferometers. Basically, you're trying to detect extremely weak signals and uh, coming from uh, uh, some gravitational events. And what you need, you have to improve the performance of those mirrors. And one of the limits is the mechanical vibrations of those of those mirror and those coatings in the mirrors. And so what we have been working on is amorphous materials, basically utilizing system that through disorder, you know, deliberately introduce disorder will suppress the mechanical vibration and improve uh, the figure merit of those mirrors. So these are the kind of things that we work on. Wow. Right. Because the, now, the, the lasers kind of like, I know I'm so oversimplifying it, the lasers, uh, like they wobbled or they they didn't quite shoot straight, and that was because of the the warping of space time that rippled through and kind of like bleh, and they made a little measurement on the lasers and the materials have to be they have to account for just the actual vibrations of everything around us. Is am I on the right track? Um, well, and then, and maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> You really want to become as sensitive as possible in uh, detecting uh, the reflection of uh, of light here, and any any disturbance, even coming just from mirrors that you would like to maybe cool down to make it even as stable as possible. If those mirrors are uh, you know built out of uh, crystalline materials, vibration are still present wow. inside, inside them. So wow. you got to so even smaller. Space. Wow. Yeah, those vibrations are also unmechanical in nature, and uh, that's why you cannot suppress them completely. That's the manifestation of quantum mechanics is low temperature, but it still is a finite residual. And, and so in order to do that, you have to now use materials that would suppress that intrinsically uh, by, by, by the way they're made. And so that's what we try to work on. Hmm. Now, what I, I have to say when you say low-hanging fruits, there is also low-hanging fruits in not only in the application, but in the discovery. And that's where the work that people like me do uh, comes about. We, we basically use spectroscopy. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Go yeah, ahead. Yeah. <laughs> as a way to, you know, we use, for instance, light, or we use other particles like neutrons or electrons to go and study a material and understand what are those quantum mechanical interaction uh, out of which the interesting properties are born? And so for us, the low-hanging fruits in some cases is 
the discovery, the, you know, the, the development of the knowledge, the understanding. And so that is also one side, which is really important here. Hmm. Can I ask one follow-up yeah. question? Um, yeah. Uh, I, when, when I looked into some of the research that you do, do you, you, you spoke about graphene. And I know you would mention, like, I believe you were hinting at graphene was one of the Nobel Peace Prize things. Um, and you might be able to grow graphene in the lab now uh, from a crystal. Um, could you talk to us a little bit about why graphene is potentially such a big deal? Yes. So uh, graphene, yes, indeed, was, uh, was a discovery that uh, I think is, uh, is, of course, received an Nobel Prize, but is one of those very ingenious uh, uh, discovery made by, you know, starting with a commonly known material like graphite. Yeah. And if you could exfoliate that system, because graphite is made of this layer of atoms, of carbon atoms, uh, which are weakly bonded. We know that graphite sort of slides on top of each other, the layers slides, uh, can slide. We, we can now try to exfoliate this. And one of the fundamental question is, can you do that? Can this two-dimensional layer of atoms be actually stable in nature? The discovery was, yes, it is. And, uh, and not only, it carries all kinds of physical properties. And uh, you know, it's, it's a conductor, it's flexible, it's transparent, is stronger than steel by weight, has all kind of you know macroscopic interesting properties, and when it comes to quantum physics, is a perfect playground to to play with it. And in recent times, uh, we you know there has been work done on, gra on graphene, where although the material per se is not a superconductor, there are ways of engineering the material to also express superconductivity in the system hmm. and make devices out of it. And this has been uh, you know. Uh, you know, fantastic word that has come out from a number of groups and is, is also done here. So graphene is, in a way, is, uh, uh, is one of the most fascinating materials which so much potential for fundamental science and the in quantum device fabrication. The interesting thing, perhaps, is that the way it was discovered, you know, something which is so promising technological, so, comp so, so, so fascinating and, uh, and so quantum mechanical in nature, it was done by using scotch tape <laughs> and uh, taking a piece of graphite and just peeling off uh, graphite and then pressing the scotch tape on, on a piece of glass <laughs> until you were left with a small little flake, which was one atom thick and or one atom thin, perhaps, uh, better to say. And my, using an optical microscope, uh, just looking at the color of these flakes, then we have beautiful pictures here. You can tell the difference between two, one layer of atoms, two layer of atoms, so bilayer graphene, or three layers of atoms, tri-layer graphene. So hmm. you can actually classify them and pick the one you want. And so this has now become an approach which has been used uh, for all kinds of materials. And, uh, and so these days, uh, here in the Institute, we had a... Uh, a, a beautiful work from a colleague who came up with the idea that instead of exfoliating graphene, you could perhaps exfoliate a superconductor. And so the very same superconductor we're talking about before that you, you're playing, you know, that you're using as a, as a demo and liquid nitrogen can be exfoliated to generate a single layer. And if you now put a, two of these layers on top of each other and you rotate them with respect to each other with a 45 degrees angle, now you have built a new superconductor. Oh, wow. And this new superconductor wow. is called a topological superconductor, which is uh, you know, really difficult to explain in terms of what it means, but it <laughs> basically is a system where electronic state have a high degree of protection. So where the quantum nature becomes extremely robust, and that is what we want to have, robust quantum mechanical properties, and in particular, in that case, they could be used for robust quantum computation. So this, this, this discovery has generated a lot of interest in the old world because it's perhaps uh, one of the most promising uh, avenues towards. Uh, Andrea, do you yeah. when you get to work, are you are you just excited every single day? Like <laughs> it just seems like you you're one happy accident away from some something incredible every single day you're working at this institution yeah actually that's true so it, it is an exciting <laughs> yeah. work environment and uh, i think pretty generally you know people are happy 
to 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 be able to follow uh, their curiosity, to be able to always uh, discover something new. Uh, there is this, you know, uh, the creativity is certainly a big part of this. It is the, some, the same kind of excitement that you, you know, you will find in any form of exploration, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's travel, whether it's intellectual, but certainly, you know, we are driven by curiosity. And, and that is very exciting. At times can also be very frustrating when things don't work out. But certainly it is. It is very fascinating, and uh, yeah, we we one day you should come and visit if you have an opportunity. I would love and, uh, to. <laughs> we can show you certainly the lab where Rick Mercer was as we as he came has developed a lot, and uh, in these days, what we do in the lab has become a place to do uh, the kind of spectroscopy that I use, but mm -hmm. in particular, what is called ultra fast spectroscopy, and so using Maser sources and in particular pulses of light, extremely fast pulses of light to learn about material properties. So it's really, to me, that interaction of light with matter has always been what attracted me the most to this field. And now being able to do this at extremely fast time scale is, is extremely fascinating. So the, the last question I have before we move on to some of our other ones is about that ultra fast spectroscopy would you be able to <laughs> could you break it down a bit beyond um like bombarding materials with lasers uh what i know i'm on the right track but that's not something i'm super familiar with could you do could you break it down for us yeah i i, I can certainly try so basically what we you know would like to do is uh, is uh, understand uh, understand uh, the movement of electrons in solid or in superconductors and understand how fast do they move, which direction do they move. And the technique we use is a technique where we, uh, we shine light on a solid and, uh, uh, and, and this light is being absorbed by the electrons. We then are ejected in vacuum and we collect them and we can measure their property. In fact, this technique is called photoelectric effect is one of the uh, milestone in the discovery of a quantum nature of light, which is made by photons, mm -hmm. and also mm -hmm. the quantum nature of solids, which is made by a particle like electrons and neutrons and protons and so on. And, and so energy can be transferred from a photon to the electron, and it's a, it's a very quantum mechanical process, and the electron is ejected. And so... Now we can study the energy, the velocity, the direction of motion, even the magnetic moment of those electrons. So pretty much we know all of the quantum mechanical properties of that electrons in the solid by, by visualizing effectively its motion. Wow. Now, this can be done uh, in an static way, but can also be done in an ultra fast way. And as an example, perhaps I'd like to uh, highlight uh, you know, where, where, where the an approach of this kind has been used in, 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 with objects and which we're more familiar with. Sure. And this is the example sure. of, uh, for instance, looking at a, a horse running and asking whether the, during the run, uh, the horse is lifting all of the four legs from the ground or not. And this is, you know, if you try to uh, understand it with your, Naked eye is actually very difficult, difficult yep. to do. Yeah. But there was an experiment which is very famous, which has been done in, in fact, 1878 at Stanford. So it's quite a while ago, uh, which is called chromophotography. So pictures that were taken in sequence as the, the horse was running by, by a number of different cameras. And it's basically equivalent to what we also could call a stroboscopic photography, where you illuminate an object at brief time intervals. And now you can be, take a snapshot of the motion. It's sort of, in a way, the uh, you know what was done before the invention of movies. And uh, the fascinating thing is that doing that technique, you can see that yes, the horse when he's running at full speed is in fact pulling off all four legs from the ground. Right. Well, now this is you know if you look at what kind of speeds you need those, those are pictures that were taken at about 40 milliseconds apart. Now, when we work in with an electron, 
these electrons are much faster. Their interaction <laughs> with the surrounding is much faster. And so we have to go much faster with the cameras. And so we have to basically use ultra fast, what we call ultra fast cameras. And ultra fast means in, in is the unit that we use is called femtosecond. A femto- oh, my goodness. oh my goodness. <laughs> Mathematically means 10 to the minus 15 seconds. And I, yeah, one way to describe that is, you know, if you imagine of taking a second and dividing these seconds in 1000 part, you know, then you get, down to one millisecond, which interestingly would be, for instance, when you are at the Olympics, you know, the, this, you know, the difference, the time difference with pe- people doing a, a downhill. This is, could be the difference between first and second, down to a millisecond. But of course, if they come in at the same, within the same millisecond, you cannot tell them apart. Now, when we talk these femtoseconds, you, you don't chop just one times, once the, the second by 1,000 times you have to do if you know you have to chop that second by 1000 times f- five consecutive times to go down to what a femtosecond is so it's basically a billion of a millionth of a second <laughs> it's like a number that doesn't even sound cr- like it's a thing that's right in <laughs> fact so like one way we thought that you know it's more uh it's easier to be to capture is to say you know the one femtosecond is in a relation to relates to a second to a single second, in the same way that one second relates to 32 million years. Oh my goodness, that's it's wild. The same that's kind wild. of. So 32 million years is a scale that goes from the presence to of the dinosaurs to today. Well, now that a time scale of this kind, when we do our our work, is equivalent to a second. So one tenth of a second is extremely fast. And uh, and yeah, we these are techniques we've developed here. Uh, and basically, you can use laser uh, laser sources that generate pulses of light, which are as fast as a few femtoseconds. And and we use those to pretty much take pictures of electrons moving in solid, stroboscopic pictures of electrons moving in solid, and be able to see how fast in which direction they move and what they interact with, similarly to what was done, you know. In, in the 1800 with conventional cameras and a horse. That is, that is mind boggling. Uh, and just, you, you get so, so much more data. I guess you get data that you can use because if it wasn't that fast, I, these, these things are too small. You wouldn't be able to even get accurate data on them at all. Um, they're just moving too fast. Wow. They're just moving too fast, interacting too strongly. And uh, so you have to be extremely accurate mm-hmm. and uh, delicate in probing them, but certainly very, very fast. If you want to take these, you know, uh, sort of time frames of of their uh, uh, their propagation. Those YouTube slow mo guys have nothing on you, sir. No. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, hopefully I said that right. I, I have it memorized yeah. past nano. I think Pico is next. Is it Pico after nano? Yeah, so the yeah. sequence is going to be milli, micro, uh, nano, pico, femto, and uh, atto. When atto. You go to, the, to the minus 18. Yeah. Wow. wow. There you go. And so in a way, you know, if you like to, we said before, quantum, quantum mechanical properties. So quantum physics is down to the infinitesimally small. Not only we would deal with the infinitesimally small, but we also deal with the infinitesimally fast, and uh, and so in a way, also if we want to establish this, uh, you know, really, what is that we do, uh, you know, when we we look at, we imagine a, a a vehicle moving, we are describing this vehicle moving, giving a coordinate, and so that object lives in a position time space. You know, we're going to tell where is it at what time. But all we do when we deal with electrons is actually in a velocity energy space. That is the kind of work that we do. So we, we, we work by looking at how fast they move, with what energy, and, uh, and that is basically what spectroscopy allows us. To. I could talk to you for hours about this. I've, I've got like 17 more follow-up questions, but uh, we have mm-hmm. to move on if that's okay. We're going to take a little bit of a right turn or I guess a right, a left turn, depending on what 
uh, pause, Dominant, because we like to chat with our guests about their pets. Do you have a pet story f- that you could share with us? Yeah, I, I thought about this, and there are many uh, uh, concerning my dog, Hunter, but actually he's just coming back here. But perhaps <laughs> the, the most interesting one is, is the fact that he's really the Institute dog, the Quantum Water Institute dog. In fact, he's not the only dog in, in the Institute. We have four dogs here. Uh, so it's really a very uh, pet-friendly environment. But Hunter has been here for many years now, comes pretty much every day. Uh, he knows uh, my colleagues. He has his own friends. And so, you know, he comes with me in the morning, come to the office, get some water, and then off he goes to visit his friends. And, uh, and uh, in fact, to a point that not just on my floor, I'm on the fourth floor, but he goes all the way down to, you know, the, uh, the reception to, to visit the receptionist. And everyone has treats for him. So he knows where to be and what time to take advantage of either a treat, which is there, or lunch that is coming. And so he does that on a, on a pretty regular basis. And at times he's gone for, for, for long times. Now, as a, as a in his institute dog, of course, he participates in meetings, <laughs> uh, meetings, strategy meetings, or, or and so on. Uh, he knows when a meeting is about to be over. If when I say okay, it means the meeting is over, and so he stands up and uh, and is ready to go. He comes to classes, interacts with the students in classes, comes during to the exam, so is uh, which is great because uh, of course uh, uh, you know he only goes and visits the students who really like to enjoy uh, company, and uh, and and that is you know uh, uh, really helping, especially in stressful situations like yeah. an exam. He comes to seminars, so has been, uh, you know, a regular seminar attendee for all of our events and to a point that, you know, when people clap, he barks. And so at the end of a seminar these days, he's used to uh, just hear the word, uh, the few words that the speaker would typically say at the end of a seminar or something like, uh, thank you for your attention, and he starts barking. <laughs> are, are not yet kept clapping. He's very fast on that. Now, the, the most surprising one was um, uh, something I, I, I did not expect. But, you know, I mentioned before gravitational waves uh, and LIGO in particular. And in 2017, a Nobel Prize was awarded for that discovery, mm-hmm. uh, the detection of gravitational waves. And one of the Nobel Prize winners, uh, Barry Berish, came to UBC to give a talk just a few days after the announcement, actually. Oh, wow. And uh, so then, of course, this turned into a major event. It was uh, given in, a, in one of the largest theaters we have here at UBC. And uh, as I got in with Hunter, uh, the room was packed. So I ended up being at the very top of this uh, amphitheater. You know, probably something like 300, 400 people were present at that time. Oh, nice. And what surprised me, though, that, you know, of course, I should have thought about it. The, the Nobel Prize had just been awarded and uh, the MC introduced the speaker and provided a, a nice word of introduction. And at the end, of course, everyone started clapping. And that was before the talk started. And but then it was so loud that, you know, Hunter ran down the stairs of this amphitheater all the way, you know, to the very middle of the room. And so this was to me, well... Definitely embarrassing. I had to run after him and get him and get him back. And, uh, you know, it was a very embarrassing moment, although, of course, everyone took it well, including the Nobel Prize winner, was pretty pleased to see that, you know, everyone was cheering, including a dog. And, uh, and yeah, that was a bit scary for him, though. It was so loud that, you know, I, could, I had to pick him up and take him up the stairs again. But he was certainly a little in shock and, and, and all trembling, uh, you know, because of that. But yeah, so my story is just, uh, you know, a daily routine of coming to work with Hunter and uh, Hunter go and visit my colleague and friends and uh, have a good time. Oh, that's amazing. I'm so jealous. Uh, <laughs> I wish Bunsen and Beaker could come more often to my school. Um, yeah, definitely. No, it's, uh, it's a pleasure. And of course, you know, we have to be very careful with, uh, of course, people who may have allergy or be afraid. But I have to say that on the... Also, for people who are afraid, has been you know has been beneficial because having seen the dog, you know, friendly dogs in work environment in normal routine has really helped overcoming the fear. And yeah. Uh, so yeah, yeah, it has worked out very well. The other sa- the other standard question we ask our guests on the podcast is for a super fact. Oh man, I don't. I my mind's already been blown a, whole, a bunch of times. But the 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 thing about the super fact is we ask our guests to share something with us. Um, a fact that would blow us away a bit. Uh, 
Do you have anything left in the tank for us? Uh, yeah, for- I can probably tell okay. you. Yeah, yeah, in the next two hours. No, I. <laughs> <laughs> so we. This is something that gets really get me really gets me really excited, and something I've been thinking about for for many years of you know my scientific career, and we just finally felt the time was right to to try to do such. Uh, an experiment again. The super fact in this case is a, is a, again a process of discovery, and we were just funded last year uh, to, for this work. So before I told you about superconductors, and uh, I told you that electron can carry a current without any resistance, any dissipation. So mm-hmm. it, it is, is really the dream. But the reason why is actually because electrons, you know, which usually would repel each other because they're charges of the same sign. They are negative charges. When the system becomes superconductive, they actually overcome their repulsion and form a pair. So now form a new state, which is called the Cooper pair, from the name of the physicist, Cooper. So really, the, the surprising thing already is that electrons can attract each other and, and create a, a, a bound state in this, in this case. And now, why the single electrons is they go through a wire like copper dissipate, hit each other and collide with atoms and so on, those bound electrons do not. And so the, in itself, this is already a big mystery. And uh, one way I, I always like to think about it in order to understand it is like having a lot of people in a room, uh, you know, in a party, we're trying to cross the room and bump into each other and they cannot go anywhere, or at least it takes a lot of effort. And uh, all of a sudden, though, if uh, the music starts, uh, what happens is pairs are being formed, and now the couples are now dancing. And as they dance in following the music, they can actually move around uh, in a harmonious way and uh, not no longer collide into each other. And they can actually uh, go. And that's because they all flow together. And in quantum mechanics, we say they flow coherently. And so that is really what the essence of the superconductor is: is is these pairs that have now uh, uh, establish themselves in, in, a, in, a, in a system. And, you know, uh, uh, and it's interesting, basically, the laws of physics change if you have one single electrons or you have an electron pair. It's a bit like, uh, you know, uh, when people get married, laws are changing. So the laws are different <laughs> for a, a single individual versus a married couple. So same thing. Now, I told you that we have, we like looking at single electron moving in solid, but because we want to understand superconductivity, really we are interested in looking at those pairs and how those pairs move in solid. Yeah. And so the yeah. the kind of experiment we are now doing, and we hope to, you know, in a matter of two, three years, to be able to do for the first time uh, in the world, is to be able to use a very high energy laser, very fast, to remove not just a single electron, but a single pair. So remove both of those electrons that make up one of those superconducting pairs. And so be able for the first time to visualize the object that that carries the supercurrent in these materials. So extract a pair out of this coherent uh, dancing ensemble. And so this has never been done, and I believe it's feasible these days. And now as the experiment I described before, you know, took about, you know, from the 1800 until uh, the end of the 1900, early 2000 to be done. I hope that in the 2020, we will be able, uh, in, the, in this decade, we'll be able to now uh, visualize for the first time uh, those pairs that make up a superconductor. Hmm. Taking the dancing couple, couple out of the dance dance hall. Yes. Or more than that, you know, being able to really witness and and observe. The the, the the pair uh, in action while dancing in, oh. the, you know, in the mechanical system. So visualize the dance. Gotcha. Well, let's hope they don't uh, dance like Elaine from Seinfeld. Um. Right, right. <laughs> no, for sure they don't. For sure they don't. <laughs> so. That is a super fact. Hoof, I'm going to need some decompress time after our discussion here. My mind is just so full. Uh, thanks for sharing your super fact with us. The last section of the podcast is a fun one. We get to know a little bit more about our guests outside of what they do. It's the important to you section where we ask the guests to share something that they're passionate about outside of what they study or maybe their career. 
Um, do you have one of those passions? Do you have something outside of your career that you really, really are into? Yes, and uh, already mentioned that in a number of ways. The ocean, the mm. ocean is my passion, mm. and uh, of course, I continue some of the activities I've done as as a kid, like diving and uh, just being on the ocean. But in the last few years, and this is really Vancouver, really has allowed me to develop that. I started sailing, so I got into sailing. So sailing so is sailing. nowadays oh, sailing. my biggest passion. So I sail with one of my kids, uh, starting from dinghies. Uh, here in the bay mm -hmm. and uh, all the way then to keel boats so in the last while we've been sailing on uh, boats like a 36 feet or a 40 feet, feet sailboat these are the ones we use and got into racing uh, also as as part of that not so much because uh, of course you know you could think that uh, uh, scientists may be competitive type but it's not just that it's really again the, the exploration the challenge uh, the curiosity of, and so we do long distance sailing. So oh, wow. Uh, wow. We, we have done, uh, you know, races around Vancouver Island. Uh, the last two years during the COVID time was, you know, as, as uh, travel was not permitted, we have sailed up and down the BC coast. And now we are getting ready to sail from uh, Victoria to Maui this summer for a race, which is called the Vic Maui race. And so, yeah. So this summer, there would be another yeah, form of excitement, which is a major attraction to me, is uh, with my friends, sail all the way to Maui and back in about six weeks or so. Yeah, I was going to say, that's a long, <laughs> yeah. holy wow, that's a long way. It must, oh, I'm so jealous of, of you just sailing up and down that Vancouver coast. It's gorgeous. And you must see all manner of sea life uh, all over the place, yes. too, birds yeah. and... Which is spectacular. Yeah, you see from you don't you can't see you now in my office, but I have a number of paintings having to do with uh, the trips we've done. I have a an orca whale fin oh, uh, right wow. here, which uh, comes from an exhibit that was done in Victoria uh, many years ago in uh, in two thousand five, mm -hmm. and uh, I happened to have found it in a in a machine shop that I was visiting here in in uh, East Side Vancouver. And so as soon as I saw it, I asked if I could have it. And so I, I have it, I restore it, and now it's here in my office. And yeah, so you see, you know, from all sea mammals, from whales to orca whales and, and seals, uh, all kind of, of birds, of course, you know. And then, of course, you see the ocean and the power of the ocean and uh, the beauty of the West Coast. Do you have a social media account? Are you going to be posting about this trip? Or are you, are you just like heading out there and enjoying it as you go? Like... Uh... That's a, yeah, no, a huge have, undertaking. Uh, no social media presence, but uh, the <laughs> friends uh, here who say we may do. And so you may find it in uh, if you look around for my friends. Actually. Well, my hat's off to you. I'm not wearing a hat, but I would take my hat off to you with your sailing and this this trip to Maui. Um, I've been to Maui once in my life. It is just an amazing place. So you get to sail on the ocean and then check out one of the beautiful islands of Hawaii. So well done yeah no it is a beautiful trip so i did it once already but only the way back so that was uh you know when you are into sailing and racing then you can sort of uh register as a crew to to return the boat mm. so oh. i did participate in a in a return in a return trip for for a boat that had actually won the big maui and so we took it back hmm. and so this time we do it with our own boat um, Andrea, we're at the end of the interview. Thanks so much for chatting with me today on the science podcast about quantum materials, superconductors, ultra fast spectroscopy or ultra fast. I think I hope I said that right. Your ultra fast. No, yeah. Um, and your touching right. story about your dog that you don't have a social media presence. <laughs> Is there any like website that people can check out about what you do? Probably I would refer them to the website of our institute, Quantum Matter Institute. And the, the, the website also has a social media presence, you know, all possible social media uh, presence. So mm -hmm. if you go mm -hmm. to our, our website, you look for Quantum Matter Institute, UBC, or QMI, as we call it. Uh, and then you would find not just the primary website, but the, the uh, you know, all of the other uh uh, apps you can uh, you, you 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 may prefer and yes then you would see about me partially but of course that is mostly about the institute although you know uh, we are a very uh, tightly knit community so when uh, when uh, 
you know, new exciting things happen, whether it is uh, uh, research or whether it is uh, uh, sort of normal life during the Institute, they, they will appear over there. So hmm. it should be interesting. And certainly, if you're interested in the science, you're interested in visiting us, either uh, virtually or in person, you know, please have a look at those, uh, at, the, at the info that you find there, because we would be most pleased to have you here uh, or, or communicate through, through email. I love it. We will make sure those links are in the show notes of the podcast. So our listeners can just click on that and it will hyperlink them right to um, the, the social media or the website, whatever they choose. Oh my goodness, Doc. Thank you so much for, for chatting today on the Science Podcast. This was incredible. I so appreciate it. Thank you, Jason. It was really nice. And uh, yeah, pleasure talking to you and uh, an honor being part of, uh, of uh, this beautiful podcast you, you put together. Oh, thanks. Give Hunter a pat for us. Will do. Will do. Thanks so much. <laughs> okay, it's time for story time with me. Adam. If you don't know what story time is, story time is when we talk about stories that have happened within the past one or two weeks. I will start. Ginger has been doing this thing. And I don't know if it's every cat that does this, but I have a bathroom. Excuse me. I have a bathroom downstairs that I use for showering and not showering. What happens is when I'm in the shower, Ginger will silently come down the stairs. Oh, so silently. And she'll silently come close to the door and at like the most silent moment, because it's pretty silent in our house, when it when the house is the most still, she will brush up or like hit the door with her paw and it scares the bejeebers out of me every single time <laughs> because you're not expecting it. You're not expecting the door to go... <laughs> And then you let her in because, like, she's, like, knocking on the door, basically. You let her in. And then two seconds later, she wants to leave. So you that let her out. That sounds like a cat. And then you let her out. And then, like, four seconds later, she's back. Then she hits on the door again. And then she wants in and then out. In, out, in, out, in, out. So, yeah, that's, that's my story. Ginger being indecisive. Mom, do you have a story? I sure do. My story is also about Ginger. Um, the other day... Jason and Adam went to the grocery store and bought some very strange food. They bought this pizza, this cheese pizza that was on croissant bread. Hey, the Adam picked that pizza. I said that's a weird choice. That weird choice came home and we cooked it for Adam the other day. And I think it was really delicious. Right, Adam? Yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing. It's an amazing pizza. <laughs> and so I cut up the slices for Adam and I said, here's your pizza. And he had some pizza and then lo and behold, left some pizza out. I think you can fill in the rest of this story. Ginger found the pizza and I didn't see her find the pizza, but I de definitely came back to the pizza a little later. I'm like, oh my God, there's pizza left out. And I picked it up. And I was like, hmm. And I went and showed you, Jason. And I said, do you think, do you think Ginger ate half of the cheese off the top of this pizza? And you said, yep. Yeah, she, she loves cheese, though. She loves cheese, but she didn't eat all, all the cheese. She saved half for Adam. It's only half cat eaten cheese pizza. But she like she ate all the cheese. There's no cheese on one half of the pizza. I know. Little cat bites. And she just, she didn't eat the croissant. She nope. just ate the cheese. That's what happened. Just the cheese. And that's my story. Yeah, we just came back from getting groceries, like just not groceries, but just some bread because we're out of bread. Um, I turned my back for two seconds and Ginger is biting on the packaging for the bread, wanting the bread. Yep. And I'm she thinking, how does she the... know? How does she know that it's bread immediately as soon as we come in the house and put it on the counter? Because it was like two seconds and she turned around and started trying to take the bread. I can up that story. Not that I'm a one-upper, but this one is a one-upper. I put some Greek yogurt into a bowl and was just going to go get the powdered protein to give it some oomph. And by the time I walked mm, two steps away from my yogurt, my Greek yogurt to the protein, I turn who is going blah, 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 blah on my yogurt? Ginger. 
Dad, do you have a story? In Pet Chat, we talked about how Bunsen and Beaker were surprise guests at graduation last week at Thurber. Um, they came in robes and a hat, and when my feet, when my speech was done, they walked across the front of the stage, and it was very, very cute. But my favorite part was after where the friends and the families of the grads and the grads themselves got to see Bunsen and Beaker. And, and uh, the dogs did so good. Like we're talking, it was really hot and there was hundreds and hundreds of people there wanting to see them. Um, and they both did so good with all of that attention. I think Bunsen was about done. He was looking at Chris and, and he would occasionally bark at her near the end. Like it's time to go. Um, but Beaker just like being around all the people. That was her thing. She just loved all of the people and wanted to see all the people. And she was so proud to be the star of the attention, I guess. Um, her face was happy face. The she was so happy. I know the resting beaker face was not on her face. I it was like, where is resting beaker face? Not here. Okay. So a, it could be cause she was so happy or B because it was so hot because what we find in our turret room in our photo studio, when it's really warm, beaker is smiling. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Oh, but also when she's really happy, like when it's time to go on a yeah. walk, she gets googly face. So happy. So googly face. I don't know if you know, but the cat's butt is at the microphone now. And I'm okay. talking through her tail. Ew. Because that happened. Ew. Well, that's my story. And that's my story. And that's my stories. Thank you for listening to my section on the podcast, Storytime. Um, I can't wait to see you guys on the next episode where we do maybe story time. Maybe the mailbag, maybe something else. Who knows? Who knows? But yeah, thank you. Bye. That's the end of another Science Podcast episode. Thanks for coming back week after week to listen to our show. Special thanks to Dr. Andrea Damaskelli, who talked to us about quantum materials. So cool. So tiny. We'd also like to give a special shout out to all of our top tier patrons on Patreon. The Pop Hack supports us. And there are many tiers of support. The top tiers get their name read at the end of the show. Take it away, Chris. Anne Schlarm, Sharon Dodson, Peggy McKeel, Chris Kelly, Samantha Dodd, Debbie Anderson, Courtney Proven, Renee Hardy, Mary Ryder, Shelby Leggett, Mary Coos, Marianne McNally, Karen Beth St. George, Bianca Hyde, Julie Smith, Andrew Lynn, Elizabeth Parmenter, Sandy Brimer, Tracy Halberg, Jenny Giger. Lila Periello, Lisa Swartz, Catherine Jordan, Donna Craig, Jody Ogren, Liz Button, Kathy Zerker, and Ben Rathard. For science, empathy, and cuteness.